Welcome to the live service from Family Worship Center. This service is also being broadcast live on Sun Life Radio, online worldwide at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. We'll have praise and worship from the Family Worship Center singers and musicians, a time for prayer, and the anointed preaching from God's Word. Now let's go live to the Family Worship Center sanctuary as the service begins.
this evening with a heart of praise. Lord, we worship you. Can we just lift our hands across this building? Hallelujah. Is he good? Is he worthy of our praise this evening? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just love you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, our God, is good. Taste and see.
Aren't you grateful that he's been so good to us? Remain standing. I want the ushers to come and bring the boxes, and we're going to take up our tithes and the offerings for tonight's service. And once again, we thank all of you for your help, not only Friday and this morning, but tonight as well. And we are looking forward to another great service tonight. Did you enjoy Brother Mosbach this morning? And I'm believing for another great service tonight, and we're just expecting God to do some great things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we are thankful for all that you've done for us. We ask that you would continue to pour out your blessings upon your people, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And march around tonight, please. Will Jesus hold my hand?
run this race, you may be seated. I'm telling you, it's good to be in the house of God tonight. And I'm expecting God to do some good things here tonight. Grace, come sing.
Thank you, Grace. Thank you, singers and musicians. Well, once again, we are delighted to have joining us from across the pond, back here once again, Brother John Mosbach. And I am excited to hear what he's going to give us tonight. So would you stand, Family Worship Center, and let's, let's make our platform welcome to Brother John Mosbach all the way <laughs> from across the pond in the hay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. I feel honored with such a gracious welcome. Please be seated tonight. Oh, how good it is to be. You know, if I would go home right now after only this worship and singing, I'd be blessed already. And uh, what a wonderful time. And I really want to thank the whole family of all the Swaggers for allowing me to be here. I count it a great privilege and an honor also to minister here, but more so also to be a friend of the ministry. And uh, we appreciate it so dear. And uh, greetings from Holland. You know, that is that little country next to that little country, Germany. And uh, if you know Holland, it's that small. But um, yeah, God is moving in that country. And I told you, I think on previous visits, I told you many stories about my father, about my mother, and how the Lord called them. And if you want, you can find it on the on the uh, uh, app or on the channel of, of the Swagger TV. But um, tonight, I thought, let me tell you a little bit about my story. Because I know you have great sermons here, and, but I thought, let me tell you a little bit about my story. And I know there is encouragement in that, and there are some beautiful experiences there. You know, I um, was a young man, and, and I'm number eight of eight children, the youngest, the last of all. And um, I was one of the latecomers, you know. Papa was already 50 when I was born, and uh, Mama was 42, I think. And um, while, when I was born, you know, Papa was preaching on the platform. And uh, Mama, while she gave birth, she was praying in tongues. And when I came out, you know, then they came to Papa and they said, it's another boy, it's a boy. So in the middle of his preaching, he said, another preacher is born, you know. So that's a little bit how I came to this world, you know, that the stamp was already there. And um, well, in my life, even as a young one, I, I, I longed for the Lord. I desired for the Lord. Now, I don't have a testimony that I went into the world and went into drugs and, and all those things. I had a desire for the Lord. And so when I finished school in Holland, I was 15 years old and I finished the school. Now I could go to another education, but I felt the call to go into full-time ministry. But according to Dutch law, you had to go to school at least until you were 16. And I was 15, I'd finished, I skipped a year. And so uh, um, I, I, I suddenly got the idea I can go to Bible school, you know. And they accepted that as being a year of schooling. So I went to Christ for the Nations in Dallas, Texas. And I'm still recorded as the youngest student they ever permitted or they ever had on campus there. 15 years old. And I went there in their one-year program. And, uh, well, that was, you know, big experience for me. Because, uh, well, you know, Texas, everything is big there. But uh, um, as a young man, you know... To, and I was a little bit mama's, uh, mama's boy, you know. And so to be, as a mama's boy, to be out of the country and for a whole year on my own in Dallas, Texas, you know, that was a whole thing that, that really made me to grow up <laughs> pretty fast, you know. Well, I was 16 and I came back to Holland and I went to Papa and I said, uh, 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 Papa, you know, I feel the call of the Lord on my life. And if you have me, I love to come into the ministry ministry and work full-time for the Lord. And he said, John, that, uh, that's good. That's good. We'll accept you. We'll take you. You can come. He said, and the Bible school will start right now. Well, I just finished a year at Bible school. So I said, okay, that's fine. Now, how long uh, will this uh, Bible school last? He said, well, it will last as long until you get your diploma. I said, okay, so when do I get my diploma? He said, when you meet Jesus. So I'm still in the Bible school right now, and I'm still going through that, but that's a good thing, you know. You're never too old to learn. You need to keep educating. You need to keep growing in the Lord. So I'm still in his Bible school. But, I, but Papa started to explain me through the years, you know, what a privilege. 
if you can come into God's private personal Bible school. You know, I had been to Bible school and it's a great Bible school and, uh, uh, and it's good to go to a Bible school and it, 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 there's many good things to say about it. But many, when they come from the Bible school, they think, now, now I know it, now I can do it, you know. But there's a difference if you come into God's private training course and the world is your classroom. I mean, every situation can be your classroom. So I experienced in so many different things in my life, uh, you know, how, how, how the things work and how the God taught me and changed me more and more into the person he could use. So yeah, I said, okay, Papa, I'm ready for this Bible school. He said, good, you can start in the garden. You know, I went into full-time ministry, but I had to start in the garden and work in the garden and work at our building department. And I remember this one couple came to us and they said, we want to work full-time in the ministry and all we want to do is preach. And my father said, well, that's difficult because we don't preach only preaching. We also have to work because the ministry is not only built by preaching. The ministry is also built by all the work that everybody labors in the church. Well, you know, they didn't fall for that. They didn't want that. They didn't want that kind. They only wanted to preach. But you know, it doesn't work that way. You have to work hard for the Lord <clears throat> in different places. And I remember I was about 16, 17, I guess. And he came to me. He said, John, come to my office. He said, I have this, uh, this name, these names of this couple in Nigeria in some town. And, I, and he had ripped a piece of paper from the envelope where their name and their P.O. box was. He said, now you go to this village, you find these people, and you organize a crusade for me. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then call me, and I'll come over and we'll have the crusade. Now, I only had a little piece of paper that was ripped from an envelope with a name and a P.O. box number. But you know, when the man of God says go, you go trusting that upon that word, you know, if he believes you can do it, you can do it. Because I didn't know, but you had no cell phone, no internet, no nothing of all that kind, you know. So I went to Nigeria. Now that's many years ago. And I tell you, that was a challenge to come there in Lagos, you know. And when you arrive in Lagos, I tell you, I had to fill my passport. You had so many checkpoints at the airport. Oh, it was corrupt there at that time. You had to put a, a blessing in, you know, every time or they didn't let you through. Now, we don't call it a bribe. It was a blessing. And, um, and if you didn't put the blessing in, you know, they would strip you. They would do all this. It would be horrible, you know. So, but I came there and, uh, oh man, coming outside when they saw this white, young skin, unexperienced, you know. I tell you, they, I'll tell you, they took me to the dry cleaners. And, um, but in any case... You know, the next day I took a taxi to that uh, town, that uh, city, and uh, the taxi driver, I said, how long is it drive? He said, oh, it's about 30 minutes. And uh, we got in the car, we're driving on the highway. Suddenly, he goes to the left side of the road, you know. I'm in shock, I never experienced that. So we're driving and all these cars are coming against us. I said, hey man, what you doing, what you doing? He said, oh, the road is better on this side than on the other side, there's a lot of potholes there. So, um, well, after about an hour, I said, so uh, how long do you think we still have to drive? He said, oh, it's about 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, another hour passes. I said, so how long do you think uh, from here? He said, oh, about 30 minutes. And about an hour later, I said, so uh, it's another 30 minutes, I guess. He said, yes, you're right. It's another 30 minutes. So I think it lasted about four hours. But we finally got to the city. And I found these people, a miracle, and we organized a crusade and I called my papa and I said, Papa, everything is ready, you can come. And so he came and we had a great crusade. Now that was quite a Bible school there, you know, just going through all that experience. And uh, when we finished the crusade, he said, now John, there's a great man of God in another city. Let's go visit him. I said, do you have a number? Can we call him? He said, no, no, we'll just go there and surprise him. And um, we went to that city, Benin City, to a man called the Benson Idahosa, you know. And we went into that ministry and, oh, I tell you, it was a great, he had a 20,000 seater faith arena. And um, we came there, well, he, he, he knew uh, he had heard from Papa, so he, 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 he heard of Masbach and, and of Holland, the ministry. So he said, okay, Brother Masbach, I'll give you five minutes tonight to share something. 
And you know, never look down upon one minute that you have to share something. Because that one minute can open the door or close it, uh, depending on how good you are, or how blessed, or how anointed you are. But, um, you know, some people, they say, if they hear five minutes, they say, well, you know, I'm not, I didn't come all this way for five minutes, you know. But Papa, he, he said, I'm so thankful that I have five minutes. And he got up and for five minutes he spoke and he stayed within his time. And the anointing of the Lord was there. And everybody was so clapping and amazed that Brother Idahosa said, Brother Masbach, please, are you willing tonight to take the whole sermon, you know, to take the whole meeting? So I learned a lesson there, you know, never look down upon one minute that God opens you. One minute can open a door for the gospel to come into an area, a place. Well, we had a great meeting there and I'm thankful that throughout the years I was able to come back without Papa and they gave the great meetings and I was able to minister there. Well, one day Papa, he said, John, uh, I'm gonna take you to India and uh, we'll take your uh, brother-in-law, um, Simon with you and uh, I'll go for three days and you and Simon go for two weeks. I said, okay, Papa, that's fine. We have a ministry there, children's home. And so we went to India and uh, well, when we arrived there, Papa went to the travel agent to reconfirm the flight. Now, I don't know about people today, but in those years you had to reconfirm your return flight. And if you didn't reconfirm it, you know, they would bump you off. So he reconfirmed it. Now coming into India in those years, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do is reconfirm my return flight because I didn't want to miss that. Because I tell you, India, that was a different country altogether to be. And uh, oh, the heat, the heat, it goes up there, you know, up to 50 degrees centigrade. Now, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's hot, it's burning hot, it's scorching hot, you know. And, uh, and then, you know, the food, and they didn't have much Western places, no Western hotels. They didn't allow any Western brands or any Western things. You had Coca-Cola was a brand they called Thumbs Up and all. And, um, and so you had curry in the morning, curry in the afternoon, and curry in the evening. I think they even made a song of it, you know, curry, curry, curry in the morning, curry in the evening, curry, curry, curry till the sun goes down, you know. It was... Um, Curry, but not the curry you have here, you know, like we have in Holland, not the mild curry. They have grandmother's thunder curry, you know. <laughs> I tell you, that curry, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so that was, you know, that was a different world altogether. So he went to the travel agent to reconfirm. So I thought, well, I'll reconfirm my flight already. And we came back into to the children's home. He said, John, what did you do? Well, you know, I found out if your father, the man of God, or the Lord asks you a question like that, you're on the wrong side somehow. You know, Adam, where are you? <laughs> or, uh, well, there's more questions like that in the Bible that you know there's a problem there, you know? And, and, and when, when Papa asked me, what did you do? Now he knew what I did because he was with me. God knew where Adam was because, well, I don't think a tree could hide Adam from God, so he knew but did, did, did Adam know? Do you know? Did I know what I, I said? Yeah, Papa, I, I thought, let me reconfirm the flight so I don't have to do that again then. That saves me a trip. He says, but John, I don't want you to come back to Holland in two weeks. Well, it got kind of tensed. And uh, my brother-in-law opened the door and he felt the tension. He said, I'll come back later, you know. And he went out of the room again. And I said, but why, Papa? What do you mean? He said, I want you to stay here, work in the ministry, and, 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 and there's a good place for you to be. I said, but how long, Papa? He said, oh, I'll give you a call when you can come home. And uh, well, I argued with him, I argued, you know? And I gave, uh, uh, I was, I think, 19, and I had a relationship, I was in my relationship with the one that would be my wife. And uh, I didn't want to stay in India, let's be honest, I didn't want to stay there. I think that's why he picked India. And um, I was, and, and so I was arguing, finally he stopped, he said, well, John, I heard your arguments. Now the question is this, are you going to be obedient or not? And a few times in my life, it came to that point that I would argue and he would stop me and say, now, are you going to be obedient or not? And I knew if on those crossroads, I would choose the wrong thing, I knew it would cost me years again to get back to that point, if I would ever get there. 
So I said, okay, Papa, I'll stay. But you know, it was just like to the child that you tell him, sit down. And he sits down, but if you look into his eyes, he's still standing. <laughs> you know, some people, they say, follow your heart. But the Bible says your heart is the most treacherous thing of all. Don't follow your heart, follow the Lord. That's a lot better thing. Follow the Word of God. Even when your heart rebels, even when your heart is against. My heart was rebelling. But still, I knew the best thing to do is to be obedient. So I was obedient there. Well, you know, Papa went back and my brother-in-law, every day he was singing, I'm leaving in 10 days. You're gonna be here indefinitely. I'm leaving in nine days. I'm leaving in eight days, you know. Well, we had a lot of fun together. But, um, well, you know, in the beginning, I would call, I would call uh, home and, uh, and you couldn't just call home. You had to go to a little shop, request a call to Europe, you know. And then they would tell you, well, come back in a few hours. We'll try to connect you. And then you'd come back and sit there for hours. And then, you know, finally I got the line. Okay, Papa, Papa, can I come home yet? No, no, no. Stay there and do the work. Stay there and do the work. So I stay. Now, one evening, one, uh, the director of our children's home, he was telling me the story of how Papa bought those buildings because it was quite a miracle how he bought those buildings and he said John this place here it was filled with cobras you know now if there's one thing I had a fear for it is snakes you know I don't like snakes any snakes small snakes small please cut that out thank you small snake a garden snake a garden hose any snake anything that looks like a snake you know, that's not for me. I get shivers. I just said, uh, so I, I, while he's telling the story, in my mind, I'm saying, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. But you know, he said, well, John, he said, last week on the field next to our home, he said, there was a cobra that we saw. And so we did fire around it. And in the midst of the flames, the cobra, he put up his head, you know, and we were able to kill it. Well, have a good evening. <laughs> I walked to my room, you know, and I, fear came upon me. And I was walking like, I thought if I make a lot of noise, if there's a snake, he'll leave, you know. Then, a, a thought or imagination came into my mind. Now, I'm telling you this story because, you know, if you listen to the story, you think I'm crazy. But I know that fear can fall upon us in the strangest of ways that we're ashamed to talk about it because we know somebody else will think we're crazy. But for us, it's a reality. The image I saw is, you know, my room there on the last house, on the top there, the toilet, the pipe of the toilet goes to the field next door. And in my mind, I saw a snake go up the pipe and that when I would go to the toilet and sit down I was afraid to go to the toilet but remember curry in the morning curry in the evening curry and that curry has an effect on you if you want or not so afraid but everything inside of me said go but I couldn't go because of the fear finally after two days you know two three days I, I was just I had so much pain I said Lord Lord I said I can't keep up with this if I don't go I'm gonna take this fear with me back to Holland because that's how fear goes I want you to know fear will not just leave you, it will just change shape, form, storyline, and it will become worse. That's why Papa always taught me, you cannot be full of faith and full of fear. One will eat the other. Let your faith eat your fear and not your fear eat your faith. And so, finally after two and a half days or so, I took a broomstick, you know. And I said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, 
in the, and I went into that toilet and I flipped open the toilet seat and there was a little salamander, you know, that jumped out and I threw the stick down, I ran out again. I said, Lord, I must overcome this. I must overcome this. I must overcome this. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the, and then I tell you, I felt true deliverance at that moment. Real deliverance. Hmm. Yeah. You're laughing at me. <laughs> that deliverance felt great. What a release. Yeah. But that fear was broken there. That fear was broken there. That fear was broken. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, after about three months, I said, Lord, if this is where you want me to work, I will surrender to you and I will do the work and be happy at it. And the moment I said that, joy flooded my soul. I got so happy there. I enjoyed it. And uh, I started doing the work, you know. So after a little while, your father's on the telephone. I had to go to the little shop. And uh, well, Papa said, well, what's going on there? Because you're not calling me if you can come home anymore. I said, no, Papa. You know, I surrendered to the Lord and I'm fine with it. I'm doing the work and everything's going quite well. He said, okay, get on the next flight, come on home. <laughs> he was waiting. For that moment that I had learned my lesson on the Bible school to surrender my heart and my life to the Lord. And uh, well, you know, I, could, I think I could write a book about the toilets in the world. Because as a missionary, you have quite some experiences on that field, you know. I remember one time I went to, uh, I think it was, uh, it was either Belarus or it was uh, White Russia or it was uh, Ukraine, one of these countries, I forget which one. And it was minus 50 degrees centigrade. So we go from plus minus to uh, minus, uh, uh, plus 50 to minus 50. And uh, they still had the outhouses there, you know. And uh, I had to go, but I, I, I opened the door and when I saw the different layers frozen up and everything, I said, well, not today, you know, not today. <laughs> and I didn't know how they would do it in their big coats going in that little uh, outhouse, you know. But uh, I never learned still. But, um, you know, I met, I, I went there and they invited me to preach in a house meeting. Now, this was a house meeting of a woman. And, you know, the woman was a, a simple woman. It was called, uh, the house was filled. Every room was filled. And in one of the rooms, they would have a little synthesizer and sing. And then I would preach there with a loud voice so they could all hear it, you know, in all the different rooms. And it was packed. I was there as the great evangelist from Holland, the man of God, you know. And, uh, well, I, I, I did my best, as I would always do, no matter if I speak to one or two or two thousands. And uh, after that meeting, I sat down with that very simple woman. I said, dear sister, tell me your story. And she said, well, you know, John, I was raised here in this communist country, and I didn't believe in God. I had a daughter, or I have a daughter, and she had breast, con breast cancer. Now, I was, I was broken, you know. My daughter, breast cancer, I'm going to lose her. I didn't know what to do anymore. But I had a Christian neighbor. And the Christian neighbor knocked on my door and said, Neighbor, I hear you have a great need. And um, would you allow me once a day, just for a few minutes, to come in and pray with you to the God that I serve, the God of miracles, that he would do a miracle for your daughter. And she was so desperate 
that she said, yes, neighbor, please do try. Ask your God. Let it, you know, I need, I need a miracle. I can't do anything else. Well, every day that neighbor would come, just for a few minutes, pray a simple prayer, and then always close, you know, in the name of Jesus, amen. So after a few weeks, she, she asked, she said, now you pray in the name of Jesus. In the, who's that Jesus? Well, what an opening. From that moment, from that point, she talked about Jesus, explained Jesus, and the day with the woman, she accepted Jesus in her life. Not long after that, God healed her daughter from breast cancer, completely healed her. This woman got so excited, so, you know, what God had done for her and for her daughter, that she went to the neighbors, knocked on the doors, and said, can I tell you what Jesus did for my daughter? She went to the next door. Can I tell you what Jesus did for... She went to so many doors there in that flat that she planted a church there. She went to the next flat, planted another church, went to the next town, planted another church, walking through the snow, walking for hours, telling people what Jesus had done for her daughter. She planted over 90 churches that way, I tell you. And I sat there as the great man of God from Holland, but I felt so humbled there for this very simple woman who had planted over 90 churches just by telling what Jesus had done for her daughter. Oh, I never forget that. That's why I never look down upon the least of God's children. Because God can do the greatest work to the least of us, you know. He can bring down the greatest champion of the devil, the greatest giant there is, through the most insignificant and smallest stone that is available. He chooses to do it that way, that all glory may go unto him. Well, as a young evangelist, I remember the door opened up to Pakistan. And I went there. And I must tell you, every time I would go to a country like that, I'd get telephone, people would call me, tell me, don't go to Pakistan, it's dangerous there, you know. Don't go to that country, it's dangerous there. But I knew the Lord sent me. Now that's another important lesson. You need to know that the Lord sent you when you go to those nations. Some nations, you can go, have a nice holiday. If it doesn't work out, come back home. Some nations, if it doesn't work out, you're dead. So choose the right nation. <laughs> know that you're sent or not, or don't go to some nations, because it's dangerous. And I went to Pakistan, and uh, I was a young evangelist, uh, early 20s, and I came there, and, uh, well, they didn't know me, you know, so the man, he wanted to give me an opportunity and an open door, so he took me to a very small church somewhere in a village, and he said, John, uh, I'll give you the meeting, you can preach. And while I was preaching there, God gave a vision to the elder that while I was preaching behind me, there was an angel of the Lord with a scroll writing down the names of those who were being added to the kingdom. Well, you know, that kind of confirmation, well, you can't buy that kind, you know. That's something the Lord can only do. So after this great leader heard this revelation, this, this, this vision, you know, they opened up the great meetings for me. And I was able to have a great crusade there with them. Or we don't call it crusade conference because a crusade sounds like you're in the attack. It's a conference, you know. Some wording is important. And um, I remember that first crusade, or conference. And um, I was preaching, you know, about healing, about salvation and healing. Uh, there's a way to bring it in all countries. And God knows the way to bring it in all countries, you know. And so I was bringing that message, and I remember that now I knew in my mind, so I was preaching, but in my mind I knew, now John, it's time to do the altar call. So uh, 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 I did the altar call, and I said, if you're uh, for salvation, uh, but it, there you do it sometimes the other way around. So I, I did for healing, and um, I was, I was praying for, for healing, and people were standing, but you know, they were standing like this looking at me like, okay, now you prove now what you preach is right. And this is Pakistan. Eh? So I was praying and I, I peeked 
And I saw them standing there looking at me. So I kept praying, you know. I kept praying, I kept praying, I kept praying. And in my mind, I was praying another prayer. You know, sometimes you can pray with your mouth one prayer and with your mind another prayer. This goes positive and negative. And uh, yeah, sometimes you're praying a prayer of faith, but in your mind you say it's not going to be done. And it can be, you know, in a different way. I was, I was praying for the people. And in my mind, I said, now, Lord, look how they are looking at me. Look what's going on. You need to do something or I'm going to be a dead man here, you know. And uh, so I, I kept, you know, arguing with the Lord. Uh, and I was a little bit afraid there. But I knew I have been praying so long, I need to stop and ask for testimony. So uh, I, I, I finally, I stopped. I said, amen. I said, now, if you receive the miracle, please come and testify for, about it. Well, they were looking at me like, uh, you know, so where's the proof? Where's the proof? And uh, I was waiting there, you know, like, okay, Lord, somebody, please, Lord, some, anybody, just somebody testify about something, you know. And um, so I was standing there. Suddenly a little girl came up and she was known there. She was a deaf mute and she got up there and they gave the mic and for the first time she started speaking and she could hear and started speaking. I tell you, what a relief. <laughs> I was so blessed. I was so happy. But it taught me a great lesson also, you know. You, you need to know that you're sent and you need to know what you're doing there. And uh, well, and it was, you know. And when she gave a testimony throughout the crowd, you know, that was a, like a wave went through that suddenly their hands went up. Suddenly their hearts opened. Suddenly people started giving their hearts to the Lord. People received miracles and there became such a great breakthrough there, you know. It was just a wonderful, wonderful moment. And I've been back so many times there. And the Lord has always blessed us with so many miracles. One of the many miracles that God does there over and over again is give children to couples. You know, um, somehow they keep having miscarriages or they can't have children at all. And we've had so many who through prayer received a child, a baby from the Lord. It's one of the great miracles that God does there. You know, the, I remember I was there last year and while I was preaching, you know, a mama brought her little baby, her child, a little bit older than a, than a baby and, and, and put it on the platform before me. And that child, uh, uh, oh my, she was just dying in front of me, dying in front of me. And so every meeting I would pray for her, you know, and pray for her. And at the end of the conference, you know, the mama came with the child. She said, John, she said, every day you prayed, every day people prayed that my child got better and better and she's doing well now, so much more well now. Oh, God is a good God. God is a good God. God is a good God. And let me tell you, I've had so many wonderful experiences. I remember I went to Umlazi in South Africa. It's a black township. And we had a big tent. Now, it was one of the most dangerous areas of the city near Durban. And uh, we wanted to get a security company to give us some security. They said, if you can guarantee your safety, we'll come. I said, well, you're the security company, so that doesn't really go over well. So um, I remember while we were there, there was a shooting across from the tent. And, and, and it was a dangerous place. I was preaching, I was preaching, you know. And in the middle of the preaching, suddenly on the right side, people were jumping up and shouting and screaming. I said, oh, to my interpreter, the Holy Spirit is moving. What's happening? Tell me what's going on on that place. And uh, I found out, you know, a snake had come into the tent. And as it was going through the aisle, people were jumping up and they were shouting and screaming. So that wasn't really the work of the Holy Spirit there. But it brought some movement there. But I remember that uh, I was preaching that evening and there was a storm outside. And in the day it was beautiful weather. And the Lord gave me a message about the disciples in the boat at sea when the great storm was there, you know. And that night it was storming, you know, raining, lightning. And uh, I was... Uh, 
I was preaching that sermon about the boat and about the disciples and suddenly one side of the tent went up you know and people Ooh! and it was like we were in that boat you know and at the end of that meeting I gave the altar call and the place flooded with people giving their hearts to the Lord you know it's wonderful as you go out to these places but not only for me for you when we go out the Lord works with us we work with the Lord I remember in Pakistan I was preaching about Bartimaeus and I said and Bartimaeus he could not see and suddenly the power went off and all the lights went off it was like I had arranged it but I had not arranged it it was the local power so with a loud voice I kept preaching you know and when I said uh, came to the end of the story and I said and Jesus said Bartimaeus your faith has made you whole the generators kicked on the lights went on I tell you it's wonderful to go on a mission with the Lord go with on a mission with the Lord and I want you to know that whenever you go be it to Pakistan if you're called for that or just around the corner the Lord will go with us he will prepare everything you know that woman in in Russia that Christian neighbor she didn't pray Lord you know this atheist woman who doesn't believe in you who is a sinner and this curse that is upon her and her family she didn't pray like that she prayed Lord you love us you are there when we are suffering and hurting there's a difference here you can pray or preach a self-righteous sermon but that's not who Jesus is or how Jesus wants to be represented we have a gospel of love we have a gospel of hope the door is still open the door of grace is still open we are his ambassadors we need to go to our neighbors we need to go across town we need to go across the world and we need to share that greatest story of all the love stories how God loves us and gave his son for us that all who believe in him will not perish but will have eternal life well you know I need to close I know I need to close but um, in 2 Samuel there's a story how David fled because of Absalom and he fled and um, he was away but while he was away there was a they, they fought with each other and Absalom had died and then the people say something remarkable and I just want to close with that verse it's very short and it says in 2 Samuel 19 verse 9 and 10 and all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel saying the king saved us out of the hand of our enemies and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines and now he is fled out of the land because of Absalom and Absalom whom we whom we anointed over us is dead in battle now therefore why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back and you know they had chosen somebody else and anointed that other person to be king over them and the real king had to flee and when they came in desperation and didn't know what to do voices came calling up why don't you say a word and ask the king to come back why don't you ask the king to come back it was the king who fought against our enemies and delivered us it was the king who delivered us from the Philistines we have forgotten what the king has done we were we were deceived by this Absalom and that Absalom didn't do nothing for us and he's dead now where is he who can help us let us ask the king to come back and today I want to say also to you that are watching maybe you have forgotten what Jesus has done for you how he gave his life on the cross how he bled and died and emptied himself completely and utterly that you might be saved delivered and receive all the promises the good promises of the Heavenly Father why don't you ask the King to come back why don't you ask the King to come back he's there he wants to come back he's waiting for that word he is willing willing the door is still open he is willing to come back into your life shall we close our eyes oh father I thank you so much for this evening that I could share the stories of how you sent me to these nations and how you worked with me and how I was able to work with you together 
Lord, I give all glory to you. You moved in the hearts and lives of people. And Lord, you changed people's lives and their destiny from eternal damnation to heavenly glory. Oh Lord, tonight, if anybody is asking, if anybody is there in the audience, here in this auditorium or at home or in the car somewhere who needs the king back in their life, maybe they ran away from the king, turned their back to him. Maybe they got angry or disappointed and were bitter, but tonight, Lord, they know they need the king back. Oh Jesus, you are the king of kings. You are the Lord of glory. We want to ask you tonight, come back into our hearts. Come back into our life. Come back into our marriage. Come back into our family. Come back into our church. Come back into this great nation. Come back, King of Kings, and be our King once again. You are the only one who can drive out our enemies. You are the only one who can break the yoke. You are the only one who can deliver us and bring salvation and bring healing and bring the goodness of the Father. Oh, tonight, do you need the King in your life? Is there a situation that you need the King? I'm not saying all of you are walking without the King, but tonight, are you sitting here and you need the King to do something for you? Ask Him right now, Father. Oh, we ask You. Oh, King Jesus, we ask You, work on our behalf. Work in our family members. Work in our life. Work in our body, our mind, soul, spirit. And do that miracle. Do those miracles that only You can do. I thank You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And uh, I'm going to give the meeting back, but tonight I would just like to stand on this corner here. And if anybody needs prayer, I will take a moment to say a prayer with you. But because of time, I'll give the meeting back. But I'll be here after the meeting to pray with all that need a short prayer. God bless you. Thank you. tonight church come on did you enjoy that tonight I'll say this his story about his snake made me hate snakes that much more but I want you to just go out of here rejoicing and being glad that you're a, you're a child of God and you're saved your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life turn around tell your neighbor you love him be back with us Wednesday night for our midweek Bible study we love you God bless you oh Jesus I'll never forget what you've done for me, Jesus. I'll never forget how you said.
hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.